Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Billy Wilder Theater. I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Hammer Museum. And I'm very excited to welcome you all to today's talk on the Cyber Feminism Index with Mindy Sue, Nora Khan, and Lauren Lee McCarthy. And thank you for your patience. Uh, we had a little line outside, so it took a while to get everybody in. I want to thank our co-presenters at the UCLA Design Media Arts Department, especially the wonderful Rebecca Mendez and the wonderful Brenda Williams for making this event possible. Um, and before we get started, I want to mention some other upcoming events at the Hammer. Uh, we have two, we have upcoming artist talks by Danielle Ding, Dean and Veluspa Jarpa in May, and two events for UCLA faculty and students coming up. One is with artist Rita McBride next Wednesday, and then our annual arts party on April 28th. So I hope that you'll be able to come back and join us for some of these other events. So now I'm going to introduce our guest speakers. Mindy Sue is a designer and technologist based in New York City. Her practice involves archival projects, technocritical writing, performative lectures, design commissions, and close collaborations. Her latest writing surveys historical precursors of the metaverse and reveals the materiality of the internet. Mindy's ongoing Cyber Feminism Index, which gathers three decades of online activism and net art, was commissioned by Rhizome and presented at the new museum in its online form. The book form of the Cyber Feminism Index was supported with a grant from the Graham Foundation, and we have copies of the book available here today. Mindy has lectured widely at institutions such as the Barbican, the New Museum, Columbia University, and Central St. Central St. Martins, and has been, been a resident at McDowell, Sitterwork Foundation, Pioneer Works, and the Internet Archive. Mindy earned a Bachelor of Arts in Design Media Arts from right here at UCLA, and she went on to get a Master's in Design from Harvard's Graduate School of Design. She's currently an Assistant Professor at the School of the Arts at Rutgers and a critic at the Yale School of Art. Mindy's going to give a demonstration lecture of the Cyber Feminism Index in action, and then she'll be joined on stage by two colleagues, artist Lauren Lee McCarthy and writer, editor, curator Nora Khan for a discussion. And after today's talk, I invite you all to join our guest speakers and enjoy some light refreshments in the theater lobby, and we'll have copies of the Cyber Feminism Index available for sale. So now without further ado, please join me in welcoming Mindy Sue. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you so much to Claudia and the Hammer team, um, especially Ike for the introduction, as well as the Design Media Arts team, Rebecca and Brenda for facilitating. So as Claudia mentioned, I'm gonna give a brief introduction to the Cyber Feminism Index, and then we'll go into a panel discussion with Nora and Lauren. So what you see before me is the Cyber Feminism Index. This is a source book, a chronology that's annotated, and a collection of online activism and net art from the past three decades. It's also structured as an index of indexes. And I'll walk you through a bit more what that means later on. But before that, we might ask, what is cyber feminism? So historically, there have been many different definitions of this term, allowing for the constant mutation of how it's changed over the past three decades. But if you were to ask me, I would start by breaking apart the word itself. So this prefix cyber first emerged in Norbert Wiener's cybernetics of the 1940s. So this field of study proposed in the most simple one-liner that not only do you impact a system, that system is also impacting you. So you're in this constant feedback loop of behavioral change of inputs and outputs. Then, when cyber was fixed to space, this first emerged in William Gibson's Neuromancer, a science fiction novel from the 1980s. So this book was important for a lot of reasons. It kind of predicted the sensory networked online landscapes that we're very much talking about today. Think the metaverse or virtual realities, but uh, Gibson's cyberspace was also very characterized by the male gaze. You have fembots and cyber babes and depictions of women in typically robotic or assistant-like roles. So when cyber, this prefix, was then fixed to feminism in 1991, this was done uh, by two distinct parties unbeknownst to the other. 
So the first was the Australian art collective VNS Matrix, and the second was the British cultural theorist Sadie Plant. So by bringing together these seemingly disparate word parts, it almost felt like an oxymoron or a provocation. How could feminists or women or marginalized communities shape what cyberspace might be? And you see a lot of examples that range from techno dystopia to utopia and everything in between. So the sticker itself comes from the website of the Old Boys Network. So this was a 1990s cyberfeminist collective. The sticker comes from the webpage of Helene von Oldenburg, in which she was interviewing the public about what they thought cyberfeminism might be. And at that time, in the mid-90s, it was met with a lot of confusion, and perhaps still is today. And again, perhaps this is by design. So even after this, in 1997, the Old Boys Network co-wrote a manifesto called the 100 Antitheses. So instead of creating a concise definition of cyberfeminism, they instead gave 100 definitions as to what cyberfeminism was not in a mix of playful, poetic, and multilingual uh, terms. This book is also the edited hard copy of a soft copy called the cyberfeminismindex.com. So this website first came out in 2020. It was made in collaboration with and developed by Angeline Meitzler, Janine Rosen, and Charles Braskowski, and it really serves as the living complement to the book. It's open access, open source, and continues to be crowdsourced. So when you first go to this site, this green blur snaps to what, uh, what appears to be a fairly standard table. Uh, but upon interaction, the site is made to feel unusual. So you, your selections are added to the side, which we call the learning trail. And these are all then able to be downloaded as your own reader. So while books have this reputation of being immutable, finite, and perhaps more reputable than websites, in this case, we're really treating the book almost like a snapshot or a document of the website's mutation. The website will continue to live on in perpetuity, and as mentioned, this, about 70% of this index is crowdsourced, so please feel free to submit, and we'll moderate and add those entries as soon as possible. This book is also an interface filled with hyperlinks that will connect you with complementary entries and encourage nonlinear reading. So in each of the entries, in the body, you'll see these green pills. So while we tend to uh, associate interfaces or hyperlinks with the digital connotation, most of their precursors were analog. So things like indexes, bibliographies, footnotes, citations, all of these were, might be considered analog hyperlinks. So in fact, in entry 146, Cyberfeminism, Connectivity, Critique, and Creativity from 1999. In their editor's notes, they actually call cross-references a hypertextual link. And then throughout the book's pages and the margins, you'll have this eye icon that pushes and pulls you to complementary or juxtaposed themes throughout the book. So I recently came across this term x-dexing, this idea of nonlinear reading, of constantly referencing the citational net, and I think it goes to show how co-authored all publications and works truly are. So if you were to follow a path of cross-references in this book, that hyperlink learning trail might read something like this. Cyberfeminism is a mutating word with a nebulous history. Its evolution is less a single root system with multiple branches than a network of entangled rhizomes, constantly and multidirectionally moving. Virginia Barrett of the Australian art collective VNS Matrix has described cyberfeminism as anti-genealogical, anti-authorial, and a hostile mucus 
never faithful to any origins. Cross-reference eight. Eight, VNS matrix, 1991. The most consistent VNS matrix genesis story is that VNS matrix crawled out of the cyber swamp in the particularly hot summer of 1991 and via an aesthetics of slime initially generated as porn by women for women. VNS Matrix forged an unholy alliance with technology and its machines and spewed forth a blasphemous text which was the birth of cyber feminism. VNS Matrix was on a mission to hijack the toys from techno cowboys and remap cyber culture with a feminist bent. This is one story. There are also stories about a slime consciousness operating via spiral space, cross-reference 181. One eighty one, Tales from the Puppet Mistress, Gash Girl, two thousand. Years after losing my machine virginity to a Mac five one two K, I have slipped through the reality grid into the clear, violent haze of spiral space. Obsession. Driven beyond my allocated four hours per day, I score extra time from wherever I can. Desire. I slide through the luminous screen to inhabit the spaces between words. The keyboard is constantly sticky. Madness. An erotically reconstructed a replicant, my biocode is being rewritten. This is better than any drug. Cross-reference 646. Six forty six. Disquartisadora Ripper. So, as you can see, the primary section of the book that we're in now feels a bit encyclopedic. So, similar to reading an encyclopedia, you probably wouldn't do so cover to cover. You might open the book at random, find an entry that resonates with you, and then in this book you can jump around to related or juxtaposed themes based off these cross-references. There's also a suite of collections in the front where we invited artists, activists, scholars, and collectives to create collections based on a theme and selected 10 to 20 entries around that theme so you might be able to have a guided tour, let's say, throughout the book. So, for example, Melanie Hoff created one for cybernetics of sex, Scott Wanetti on indigenous futurisms, and et cetera. And Nora and Lauren later today will give a very brief learning trail of their own. If you're looking for something more intentionally, there's also an index of titles, as well as an index of people. But if you're looking for some more serendipitous discovery, there's also the index of images. All New Gen, VNS Matrix, 1992. Sabotage the data banks of Big Daddy Mainframe. Your guides through the contested zone are renegade DNA sluts. The most wicked is Circuit Boy, a dangerous techno bimbo. Be prepared to question your gendered construction. Genital Panic, Mary Magic, 2020. We must reconsider the normative body and how disobedient bodies are already pathologized, from the medicalization of infants born of ambiguous genitalia to the disqualification of intersex athletes on the basis of biology. These guidelines matter. They determine how we are policed and how we are surveilled. The Black Trans Archive, Danielle Brathwaite Shirley, 2020. Welcome to the pro-black, pro-trans archive. This interactive archive was made to store and center black trans people, to preserve our experiences, our thoughts, our feelings, our lives, to remember us even when we are at risk of being erased. So for this site, when you first arrive, you're greeted with three options. One, two, and three. The first is if you are black and trans. The second is if you're trans. And the third is if you're cis. So depending on your selection, you would have access to a different body of content within this online archive. Tell 
Time Traveler, Skawanati, 2008. This is a website from the future. Watch for upcoming episodes in which Hunter Deerhouse sails to Europe with Pocahontas in A.D. 1615, aids and abets the Dakota Sioux Uprising of 1862, and finds true love in the Kahnawake Mohawk Territory in 2009. So what you're seeing here is a machinima. A machinima is a portmanteau of machine and cinema. So these are typically video games there are plays that happen within video games, and then they're recorded, and that documentation ultimately becomes video art pieces. Um, and Skawanati is largely seen as one of the first indigenous net artists. And you can watch all six episodes or machinimas on Skawanati's site. Afro-Cyber Resistance, Tabata Rizer, 2014. We need to quickly snap out of the Web 2.0 fantasy of the internet as a promised land. Whatever visions that ideologically shaped this technology at the beginning of the development of computers have now successfully been structurally organized to serve the primary interests of North American governmental bodies and the commercial interests of the world's wealthiest companies. The Bitch Mutant Manifesto, VNS Matrix, 1996. Your fingers probe my neural network. The tingling sensation in the tips of your fingers are my synapses responding to your touch. It's not chemistry, it's electric. Don't ever stop fingering my separating holes, extending my oozing boundary. But in spiral space, there is no they, there is only us. Suck my code. Okay, we'll read a couple more of these before we transition. Daddy Residency, Nahi Kim, 2019. I plan to have a baby after seven years by artificial insemination. And I'd like to have a variety of companions for that rigorous but invaluable parenting experience. So I'm launching this open call for daddy residents who want to raise the baby with me for a certain amount of time. The application deadline is July 31st, 2025. So that means you all still have two years to apply to be Nahi's baby daddy. Okay, last but not least. The Old Boys Network, 1997. The Old Boys Network is regarded as the first international cyberfeminist alliance. Normally, the term Old Boys Network is used as a metaphor to describe an informal interrelation of men. Nowadays, the Old Boys Network may be used for a dangerous cyberfeminist virus. So this is a title sequence. And typically, these are reserved for the ends of films or video art pieces. But it goes to show the huge network of people that really made this project happen. So not only those who helped with the production, like the designers, editors, lithographers, publishers, but also those who developed the content, the forward and the afterward and all of the collections. But as mentioned, the majority of this index is crowdsourced. So the referred by, these are the people that I first spoke with four years ago when I was just having phone calls with people trying to figure out if they could give me their references, which in turn led me to others. The submitted by are all of the people who submitted on the website. So this goes to show how co-authored and cacophonous this history really is. 
So I worked on this book in close collaboration with my good friend Laura Combs, who designed the, the book. And we actually considered what would it be like if we did not have my name on the cover, especially if so much of this is co-authored. And ultimately, we decided to leave this here, not as a representation of who to celebrate, but rather as someone that you might need to blame. Because I think when you see these other compendiums of archives or histories, when there's no byline, it's almost presented as an objective truth rather than a subjective singular history or lens. So what we're trying to do here is not say that this is a compendium that shows every single piece of cyber feminism over the past several years, but rather that it's a subjective, constantly mutating, co-authored text with moderation rules created by myself and others that is really serving as a representation of what cyber feminism might be. And it's constantly shifting over time. Another thing I like about this is it kind of acts as a call to action. So while this book was largely created online, it also acts as a representation of a material gathering, a collection of disparate items, uh, rep or that was created collectively through social gatherings. So we're in a social gathering now, and I'm almost giving you a prompt that if you see something in this book that resonates from yourself, your peers, or historically, please feel free to contribute, and we will make sure that that's represented in some way on the site. I also like letting this run because it shows that these types of events are ways to introduce other people who have very complementary themes and that are likely in this book themselves. And today with us, we have Nora Khan and Lauren Lee McCarthy. So we're gonna shift to that half and I'll introduce them momentarily. Thank you so much. Is it possible to get a light? Oh uh, yeah, perfect, thank you. So, Nora Enkon is a curator, editor, and writer of criticism on digital visual culture, the politics of software, and philosophy of emerging technology. She is the executive director of Project X for Art and Criticism, publishing Extra Contemporary Art Journal in Los Angeles. Khan's forthcoming books include No Context, AI art, machine learning, and the stakes for art criticism, as well as the artificial and the real, among others. Lauren Lee McCarthy is an artist examining social relationships in the midst of surveillance, automation, and algorith algorithmic living. Excuse me. She has received grants and residencies from Creative Capital, United States Artists, LACMA, Sundance, and Ars Electronica, among others. Her work, Someone, was awarded the Ars Electronica Golden Nika, and her work, Lauren, was awarded the IDFA Doc Lab Award for immersive nonfiction. Lauren is also the creator of P5.js, an open source art and education platform that prioritizes access and diversity and learning to code with over 10 million users, perhaps many in this room as well. So with that, I'd like to invite Lauren and Nora to the stage. Thank you. All right, so as mentioned, Nora and Lauren are also going to give a brief overview of how they've been engaging with this book. Um, it's been such a blessing to see these books used and beat up and marked up, and the notes and dog ears in these gives me a lot of joy. So I'm excited to see what kind of themes they've, uh, they've both been able to pull from this publication. Nora, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Mindy, for, for having both of us. It's been 
such a pleasure to see you tour the Cyber Feminism Index around the world and see people interact with it. Um, and thanks everyone for coming today. I've been using the index a lot as I'm working on a book about AI art and AI generated in imagery. And I've been using the index to kind of untether the argument. Mm. So every time I'll write something down, I'll refer back to the index. And so I try to make a little bit of a reading trail of my like associative connections. Um, I don't think I can as elegantly work through <laughs> the index that you, the way you did. So I just kind of wrote out my notes. Mm. Um, and I just also want to commend the way that the book is really this argument for like a politics of citation. Mm -hmm. And as like a as a writer and thinker, you help me like undo all of my fixed arguments about technology. So I started with a simple argument that runs through the book is which is what is AI and how do we talk about AI? Is it a computational system? Is it material infrastructure? Is it algorithms that we can understand or not understand? Is it the muddled myths that we have um, about its capacity, anthropomorphized to the point that we can't really engage with it? Um, so I started in the index at uh, entry 635, which is by Meredith Broussard, Artificial Unintelligence, How Computers misunderstand, misunderstand the World. And the quote in it is, making a case against techno-chauvinism, the idea that computers always get it right, Broussard argues that it's not just true that social problems would inevitably retreat before a digitally enabled utopia. And we learn that a lot of the experiments that she undertakes in the book, like using machine learning to predict which passenger survived the Titanic, uh, driving in an automated car and seeing all the mistakes it makes along the way, makes it really imperative that we understand the limits of technology even as we describe its futures. And understanding those limits allows us to make you know, better choices. So for me, that expanded even, uh, you know, at its ground, the argument to place it within a context of understanding the ways the technologies fall short helps destabilize the grip of this core idea that computers always get it right. And then destabilizing that idea of like mathematical or objective accuracy is in itself critical because it's not always evident that it's needed. So I flipped from that using the index in the back to the next uh, passage that had artificial in the title, 125, by Alison Adam, Artificial Knowing, Gender, and the Thinking Machine. Quote, a gendered vision of the world is inscribed in the technology of AI, albeit in a subtle way, which must be uncovered and described. Artificial knowing is a type of knowing which goes on in the computer systems, simulations, and robots which comprise the technical objects of AI. Adams writes, I intend no special commitment to realism in this. And so then the theory becomes as much about the symbolic field where we keep the ways of the knowing of women and the real knowing of human actors out of thinking machines and as a point for more thought experiments. So for me at this point, it then <laughs> leads me out into like the Google comments of what would it mean for our thinking machines and our artificial knowing to include humans' real knowing, and which way, in what ways is this lack covered and for what reasons? The final two references that I use are 459, Juliana Huxtable, there are certain facts that cannot be disputed. Where Juliana Huxtable is an incredible artist, made artworks uh, that you know, take up the internet as, quote, a place propelled by the power of visual symbols where virtual spaces are twilight zones of desire, where the presence of human and digital characters propel us into fantasy. This helps me zoom out and clarify that the place that we interact and think about technology or ideas about technology is the same place that we negotiate all sorts of desires and fantasy and longings and fear. And I enclose with uh, legend Catherine Hale's 155, How We Become Post-Human, Quote, I'm gonna read this in full because it's so good. Here at the inaugural moment of the computer age, the erasure of embodiment is so performed that intelligence becomes a property of the formal manipulation of symbols. Like all good magic tricks, the Turing test relies on getting you to accept at an early stage assumptions that will determine how you interpret what you see later. The important intervention comes not when you try to determine which is the man, the woman, or the machine. Rather, the intervention comes much earlier when the test puts you in a cybernetic circuit that splits your will 
desire, and perception into a distributed cognitive system where represented bodies are joined with enacted bodies through mutating and flexible machine interfaces. As you gaze at the flickering signifiers down the computer screens, no matter what identifications you assign to the embodied entities you cannot see, you've already become post-human. So in thinking about these four references, um, Adams, Broussard, Hills, and Huxtable, I you know, can kind of clarify and expand on my own argument. I can understand that you have to uncover the underlying logic of artificial knowing because it's covered to begin with. And then where does that come from? A driving assumption about the correctness of computers, which is interesting not just because of the mistakes that computers make and the ways that they know otherwise, but because the intelligence is a construction of this wild field of visual symbols which channel all of our desires and our ideas and our anxieties, which I'm sure we'll, we'll get into in a bit. Uh, this is a field of like projection and fantasy uh, as much as one that is constructed and nameable. So you know, what I really admire in using the index is the way that the kind of rhizomatic practice of cycling around all these incredible scholars and thinkers helps me get a little bit closer to answering this infuriating question of how do machines see, how do they understand us, and what do they do with that information? And further, what are the fictions about AI that are created and where are they created, and how does that drama of fiction get registered as truth and not fiction? So in roaming around, I see all these different approaches to the problem. Uh, you know, uh, I start to move away from my desire to have one argument or one master narrative and keep including the collective thinking that's within the index. So that's my reading trail. Thank you so much, Nora. I'm excited to unpack some of those things. I, no, I don't need the Wi-Fi. <laughs> Thinks I need it. Um, OK. Uh, I didn't know what to do with this book. I just carried it around with me for a couple weeks, like trying to figure out how to deal with it. Um, I flipped from 1991 to 2020. Uh, yeah, 2020. I spent a lot of time online in 2020. How about you? <laughs> um, and I found some things that I liked. Women's engagements with online technologies are often characterized as casual and social and not hardcore. Radhika Gayala, 2014. So in summer 2020, I became the Associate Dean for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at the UCLA School of Arts and Architecture. And I ended 12-hour breakdown-filled days of Zoom in a pile on my living room floor. And then I thought, can I make a clone of myself to perform for me? I'm listening. I'm here to listen. I hear you. I'm here. I'm here for you. I'm here with you. I'm hearing you. I'm hearing what you're saying. I see what you mean. Plugging into cyberspace requires the creation of a personal mask, which becomes a signature, a thumbprint, and a means of recognition. Lynn Hirschman, 1994. I'm seeing. I'm looking into it. I'll look out for it. I'm watching. What if all systems had ratings, clear stamps in large font that say, this is intended for use with humans and not intended to run autonomously? Please check every few weeks. Mistakes will be made. Caroline Sinders, 2018. I see. I see you. I feel you. I really feel you. I feel that. I feel it. One of the most diabolical elements of entering virtual reality is that people can only recognize each other when they are electronically disguised. Truth is precisely based on the inauthentic. Masks become part of the grammar. Identity is the first thing you create when you log onto a, onto a computer service. Lynn Hirschman Leeson. 20, uh, 1994. So it's 2001. Mendy and Keith Obadi Obadike place Keith's blackness for sale on eBay. Benefits. 
This blackness may be used for gaining access to exclusive, high-risk neighborhoods. Warnings. The seller does not recommend that this blackness be used during legal proceedings of any sort. Um, that was from 2001. So they placed their listing in the black Americana category of eBay, calling attention to this existing marketplace, one of many sites of transaction where blackness is something to be bought and sold. How does the infrastructure we've built shape our identities? I turn myself into a system. I develop a side gig as a human Alexa, watching you in your home while controlling it for you. You can call me Lauren. Hey you, staring at the flickering, bleeding screen. We see you, right now, through the cameras on the ground, above the clouds, and within your very hands. Hackers of Resistance, 2017. I follow you from room to room, switching lights on ahead of your steps, giving recommendations, watering the plants. I love being of service. I like being told what to do. We realize that there may not be a feminist response to the question, hey Alexa, what's the weather? What this reveals is not that feminism is lost for words, but that Alexa isn't designed to elicit feminist conversations. In fact, it's not designed to elicit conversations at all. How to make a feminist Alexa. 2019. Anything Alexa can do, I can do better. I can understand you as a person and anticipate your needs and desires. We are geek horrors, cyborg bitches. We scream noise in cyborg covens, soldering and alchemy. We spit out performances and install new Linux. We love recycling and repairing with our breasts bared. Cloud Kinky, Magnet, and Paula Pin, 2012. I want to be your proxy, your stand in, your understudy, your sub. I offer myself as your surrogate, carrying your baby while you monitor and control me with an app. What I eat what I do, what thoughts I think about. You have 24 seven access to the body in which your baby is growing. What else might we control soon? Raise yourself right. Advances in genetic technology allows for this simple do-it-yourself cloning kit when one of you isn't enough. Scrape, clip, cut, and plant. You can't love others until you love yourself. Julia Scher, 1997. The existing normal heteronormative family structure is not working. Nahi Kim launches her daddy residency call. So we're talking glitched relations, glitched babies, glitched bodies. The glitched body remains contemporary, rejects historical processing, and celebrates its disorder as a mark of success within a social system that strangles with the fetishism of categorization. Legacy Russell, 2017. So after two years of trying, my remote control surrogacy pursuit gets shut down by the medical system. The agency to make decisions about our bodies taken away again. And the first flight of the abortion drone was in 2015 departing from Germany and landing in Poland. Soon after, the German police confiscated the drone controllers and personal iPads. Abortion drone, 2015. What other parts of ourselves can we exchange? I'm looking for the edges of where you, and I, you end and I begin. We've now been conditioned to test and swab and spit and give our bodily data away in order to keep ourselves safe. I'm swapping saliva through a mail order service I provide online. Resist neoliberal capitalist profiteering of unconsenting bodies 
and the unconsenting planetary. Create spaces and temporalities where consent is possible. Mary Magic, 2015. Spit in my face, spit in my hand. You say risk, but I say chance. It may seem as though everything is teetering on an edge. We're more connected than ever. Spit fountain, spit mountain, spit in my mouth. I'll hold it on my tongue until I find a container. I want to own some of you, just enough to make a copy. Spit in my eye, all I want to see is you. Are you the perfect specimen? Some will read this text as a manual for a kind of gender bioterrorism on a molecular scale. Others will see it in a, see it, see in it a single point in a cartogra cartography of extinction. Paul B. Preciado, 2013. Our bodies are territories in dispute, algorithms are a disputed territory. The internet is a disputed territory. Manis Manifesto for Hack Feminist Algorithms, 2018. So what I'm trying to say is, as I read through this book, I read over and over, we're here together, we're doing this work, we need to do things differently, we imagine the world differently, it has to be possible. This is a collaborative course for interrupting and rebuilding. Morshin Aliari, 2017. So you're listening to me talk, but I want to be direct here. I want the information in this book to get further into the public consciousness. And so this is what you can do read this book, like don't just buy it, buy it, borrow it, and then read it. Give yourself space to feel it. And this book smells really good. Well, it really special. does. Thank you, Mindy. Um, sorry, a couple more here, and I'll wrap up. Let's make the gestures, let's say the words, let's manipulate the objects. Let's practice this art of changing consciousness at will. Let's be cyber witches. Cyber witches manifesto, 2019. So carry it around with you, it's heavy. Feel your body holding this weight. It feels good. Find the parts of it that are your favorite and remember them. And then give this book to someone else that should really do the same. Last one. Whispers equals new array. Zero. Breathe me. One. I will love you forever. Two. Skin. Three. Skin on skin. Four. Skin on skin on skin. Six, soft, seven, slow, eight, can you feel me? Nine, touch me, 10, one more cigarette, 11, I am so open, 12, I wanna feel you inside me, 13, smoke, 14, I wanna breathe you, 15, we are smoke, 16, yes, 17, deeper, 18, I'm disappearing, 19, warm. Rindon Johnson, 2017. In a previous event, one of the audience questions or comments was rather when they got their book, they were almost treating it, the use of it, like a seance. 
they would open it, close their eyes, and find these things. So I think that, thank you, Lauren, for reiterating that point, that this thing, the various entries in it, all of them include voices by other people. And this cacophony that you hear, some of it will actually feel very clarifying to you. I think one thing that I pulled out in both of your um, trails was this idea of embodiment and perhaps this idea that disembodiment is what we're told the technology will do. So in Nora's, um, you say that embodiment has been erased, so all we have is intelligence, or one of the quotes. And in this way that we can destabilize objectivity and try to rewrite these histories of technology, even Lauren, you say, or one of the quotes was, that when you first go online, one of the first things you have to do is create an identity. So I'm curious if we can kind of talk about the material components of technologies at large, because it isn't just this cold, sterile uh, tool that we use. It's also quite entwined and entangled with ourselves as people. So this is quite broad, but I'm wondering if we might start there. Sure, yeah, I mean, I think that was one of the things as I was flipping through it that I was struck by was just how embodied and how physical um, the book was, and I was really excited about that, and I think that is a marker of what we're calling cyber feminism here. Um, I, like you said, I think so often these two things are separated, or work that has to do with the body is um, kind of treated like it's not real work, or it's not um, real knowledge. And so I really like the way that um, so many of the voices in this book really f make that argument clear. And, I, and it makes sense, right? Because um, we are embodied full human beings as much as we may think that we're just like avatars online. It's not, that's not real. Yeah, I think from um, my end, uh, my job as a critic or writer of this art and tech space, I mean, it, when you spend a lot of time thinking about thinking machines, you can start to become pretty <laughs> disembodied from yourself. Um, and I think in working very hard to try and read what like the embedded code of ideological intent of technological design is, I always have to draw on my own experiences like a femme moving through the world to argue that that embodied experience is not secondary to the concerns of you know a grand theory or computational purity or mathematical correctness. And so that helps me, even if it's not always explicitly in the text, because I think for a long time I didn't write about myself in the text. It was this kind of shoulders up exercise. Um, being able to identify alternative histories and alter articulate to myself and to others other sets of references that you know counter the tech utopian and uh, like the kind of mythology of technological process progress means that I have to unlearn a lot of the ways I was trained as a writer or scholar, which was you know having a firm set of references and ideas that I work in a linear pattern to build on. Instead, reading through the index, you're reminded of the ways that the thinking about technology is collaged by many. It's emergent, it's relational, it's a process of constant revision. And in that, this kind of strict binary, and I'm sure we'll talk about binaries too, between the embodied and the abstract, the physical and the digital really start to break down. And you understand um, the digital and the virtual and your relationship to technology as emotional, psychological, that was you know, a gorgeous kind of rendition and ritual reading of like our descent back down into the body. And it's a reminder of the ways that these systems like you know, affect you physically and emotionally, um, but also change the conditions of you know, your children's generation and generations to come. So the materiality has to be, e even if it's while you're thinking critically about it, needs, I need to remind myself of it constantly. Yeah. In this early aughts book by Lisa Nakamura, which is also in this book, Race in and for Cyberspace. Um, she speaks about how when people were first going online for the first time, it felt like you could be and do anything, right? Like this was the time where we could swap races, we could build empathy. 
But what they found was instead of empathy building and race swapping, there was actually a lot of identity tourism and the exacerbation of stereotypes. Because as you're both saying, even when we're going into an online, online space with an avatar, we're bringing in all the conditions of our physical bodies into that space. How we speak, how we engage with others, all of these things are conditioned through physical life. So I think that even uh, Legacy Russell, when she talks about there is no more IRL versus URL, online versus offline. Everything is just AFK away from keyboard and everything is quite entangled. Um, I'm curious if we can also speak in this process of creating your own learning trails. I think it really showed how the different ways knowledge is accumu accumulated, resources are assembled. What are some of the citational hacks that you've started using in your own practices, especially as you started to kind of unlearn these processes or even in performative ways, moving away from a theoretical academic paper? Are there any hacks that you've chosen from the citational norms that we've been taught? You can start. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, absolutely. I think for, you know, when I started writing, I was writing about, um, I'm sorry, like uh, publishing as like a writer. I was writing kind of in a vacuum about video games and game design and sound design games and belief in games. And I was, you know, coming out of a fiction MFA, and so I was just applying the same tools I used for thinking about world building and belief and a fictional world to how I spoke about games and wrote about them. And so I found myself like mapping uh, systems of learning right on top of how I thought about te technology and games, and take games as, you know, deadly seriously as I took you know, like a novel by Stendhal or some other text that I had, you know, like been raised to. Um, love is canon and, and loved as well. So what if we treated games and virtual worlds the same way we trot, uh, think of Tarkovsky or think of you know, a great novel. Um, but in that process of collage like, and, and working through relationship with games and AI, you stumble on all of these like uncanny experiences that was really hard to find the right language for, which was still very, remains exciting for me as a writer, is that you start to collage and assemble references from engineering, from mathematics, from poetry, from you know, social sciences, and you find this a lot in game studies too, is that people assemble and collage and create these really radical, wild forms of language to describe what happens in games. And so in my mind, I was just moving fluidly between, in my mind it seemed fluid, I don't know if it is fluid from the outside, but between like the game-like system of culture, uh, you know, a game itself through a system of engineering, a system of design, and started to map and try to track the types of ideologies embedded between them. And so uh, there wasn't often, um, you know, a lot of interruption between writing experimental fiction and writing about these spaces. It was the same kind of invention of language alongside which required an assembly of references to kind of articulate what am I describing, what's the ground, how are people thought of in this space, how is space thought of, what are the you know, values and assumptions made about the future and the future we should live in? And sort of, sort of peeling back all of the layers of world construction to see how the system was built. So in my, in my mind, at least, there's no interruption between the two. It's been the same kind of process. I love that. Um, I think dealing a lot with performance, I'm kind of constantly collecting, and a lot of times it's unconscious. I'm collecting words and gestures and looks and feelings from the people around me. So I feel very, uh, and from the work that I'm looking at or the, the things that I'm encountering, so I feel really aware at, at kind of at all times that whatever I'm making is really this product of a, a collection, or I think, Mindy, you've referred to it as kind of gathering. Um, and then, and then dealing with performance, it's also like your, the audience is a part of it. So actually, at the site of the, the presentation or the making, there's another kind of referencing or s citation that's happening just in the kind of communion you have with the people that are in the space with you. Um, so I think my approach to uh, collecting or gathering in that way has been similar to my approach to doing that online or looking through references or doing research. Um, it's really picking up these bits of things and trying to remember where they came from. Um, and I think the, the thing about citation that is exciting is it's this chance to 
um, like really lift up and point to the things that you think other people need to be seeing that are like really meaningful to you. So it's less of a like, let me do my homework and show you how I got here and more like, this is my chance to point to this. I have your attention for a moment here, look at this. Um, and you know, that's, that's similar to the, the work in teaching too. That's really exciting to me. Um, uh, I was gonna say one more thing, but I forgot what it was. So I'll just leave it there for now, yeah. Um, time flies. I, we had a whole list of questions, so I'm not sure if we'll get to all of them, so I'm going to hop around a bit. Uh, just to, one of my favorites, uh, on your point on like this idea of like intuit, intuitive citational gathering, um, in the byline of this book, we wrote edited and gathered by Mindy Sue. And this was because Laura, Colt Combs, the designer of the book, found that same byline by Adrienne Marie Brown. And she gives amazing citations because in her footnotes, she talks about the context of how she came to an idea. So even if she's not directly citing a paper or a lecture, she'll say, I was at this lecture by so-and-so and it made me think of this work by this person. And then the person next to me said this. So I think it's also a way of showing some informal citations that still really start to shape the connections that we're all making. Um, and I like this idea that we can lean on intuition more, even if maybe that's, we've been taught to disregard that um, in exchange for something that feels more quote unquote rigorous or scholarly. Um, I really, I want to ask this question because it's so relevant right now, and then maybe we'll end with one more after that. But, so the, the, your trail that you talked about was really about artificial intelligence, and a lot of your performances, Lauren, are also very AI focused. And I'm sure everyone in this room right now is thinking about AI in some way. We're kind of seeing this swell of uh, artificial intelligence or AI right now, similar to this swell of NFTs and Web3 conversation in, the tw in 2020. So with the latest boom of ChatGPT4 to every competitive company creating their own version, I'm really curious how we can start to think about AI with its potentials and downsides, especially in this climate, especially with fears that artists' work is just being generated and produced, students are creating essays and submitting them online. Like, How can we begin to think of AI as a, as a potential, as well as acknowledging some of the, the criticism surrounding this? Do you want to start, Lauren? Sure. Um, I think what, one of the things that we're seeing with this kind of like daily release of a new mind-blowing um, tool is really an acceleration, uh, an acceleration of technology, an acceleration of our capabilities as humans interacting with technology. Um, and I think also an acceleration or an increase in speed in the way that we're expected to process and think and relate to each other, which I would question whether we're really capable of mm -hmm. that rapid acceleration. Um, so I think in terms of potential, it's exciting to imagine what's possible uh, with this kind of added um, speed to what we're, we're all doing. Uh, but the, the big concern that I have, like I said, is just that I think things take time. Um, I think it's been said many times, probably in this book too, um, that you know operating at speed is a way of reinforcing the status quo, which we know is um, prioritizes some people and really disadvantages others. Uh, because you know the argument that there's not enough time or there's not enough money or we have to just keep going until we figure out something better, but we could keep going forever. So um, I really appreciated some of the um, citations in, in this book and other work that's being done that has been making a case for just pausing and slowing down. And I think uh, that is needed more now than ever. I think we saw this acceleration happen over COVID. There was like a momentary pause and then everyone was like, oh wait, we don't get to pause anymore. We're gonna just keep going now, even if you're not actually able to function or process that quickly. Um, so that would be the, the opportunity here would be for us to somehow find ways to hold that space and hold time uh, so that our the intuition within ourselves can catch up with what's happening technically. Yeah, I take the index reading it through or, uh, as closely as possible as just 
um, a really great set of warnings about thinking about AI in terms of these bin in terms of these binaries of fear or elation or the future or doom, and you know, if one thing I find often writing even slightly critically about AI is you're immediately um, in certain spaces either deemed a Luddite who wants to run into the woods and throw your devices into the water or you know, a hater of some kind. Um, and so I think that binary that we, and the drama of moving back and forth between AI is fearful or just a tool that happens, a tool that happens to embed all of our inclinations to collective power control like at scale, um, it, it tends to have us focus on the newest model, the newest large language model, the, the newest piece of novelty that pops up in Twitter. Um, but the questions still remain the same, and for me at least. You know, if, how are we going to interact with a world where many of our decisions are nudged and shaped by algorithms? How are we um, going to relate psychologically and emotionally to a world where a lot of decisions are created by artificial beings that we can't see? Do we call for just like for that open letter recently for an outright pause, or do we embrace working with the machine? And so, of course, there are advocates on both sides. I think what I'm most interested in is the way that knowledge and knowledge construction move is moving towards assemblage and prompts. I mean, I could talk a bit about you know ML and AI-based artworks where I find and spend a lot of my time as a curator. Um, they form a kind of case study for thinking through the downsides and the potential. They demand like our criticality and thoughtful engagement. I'm sure maybe folks have seen a lot of AI artworks in the last like uh, five years and maybe even in over the, especially over the last year in kind of headlines um, where artists you know take a massive data set of 500 million images or a billion images or four billion and then create pieces, these like gorgeous visualizations that hallucinate or dream. Mm -hmm. And I think you're seeing in you know, even the last couple of months a, a real kind of critical collective pushback against that thinking of the machine dreaming or hallucinating. And so what I'm curious and always kind of enchanted by is this um, way that AI creativity forms this playground where we can see at scale how people negotiate their anxieties about AI, about um, their awe or enchantment with AI and human collaboration and art, and also what kind of work matters and what work we value. Um, and I, yeah, I guess the anxieties about the uniqueness of our creativity and the position of it, you know, I hope that it would generate all kinds of creative flourishing, but I think what the index really argues is even as we're enchanted by the newest development in AI and the kind of novel, beautiful things that it helps us create as like creative people that we hold it alongside, you know, social critique of like the tools that are produced by major companies and how they're actually being used in the world so that they're held hand in hand. It's not one or the other, it's both. Yeah, I think that these days we're often really thinking about the early adoption of new technologies. And as you're both saying or reference, there's been a bit of a uh, historical amnesia about the relevance of these tools. Like we call AI or Web3 or VR new, but these things have been in development for a long time. Like you had researchers for uh, head mounted displays in the 60s or even um, decentralization peer to peer has been around since the development of the internet. So I guess I'm curious, do you think this tech amnesia is emerging from some sort of generational re-education or uh, maybe the acceleration that's happening? Why do you think that we're constantly forgetting a lot of these things that have happened historically? Did you answer first last time? Okay, I'll go. Um, I think this comes back to you know, something we were talking about backstage is this, um, there's this amazing book by Fred Turner called By Counterculture to Cyberculture, which I um, encourage everyone to look at which traces that kind of founding ideology of Silicon Valley and this idea of the internet as a potentially utopic space, computers as this like portal to liberation, to like the first days of the pilgrims or the you know, the first people who came to the to the um, to the Americas, looking down from the city on the hill and like surveilling the wilderness as the same view of the engineer, the same view of the designer intervening into the world with techni or technological tools. And I think it's so 
deeply embedded in the systems that are designed for us and is so deeply embedded in the ideology of the tech systems that we use that it's hard to see. It's also designed to be not seen mm -hmm. and not seen as you know, full of human intent. Instead, this neutral, smooth, beautiful object that you pick and pick up and you know, helps you navigate and work through the world. And so I think looking through the index moment, it was just, I think the biggest point of amusement is like how frequently the same points, the technology is not neutral, the technology is, is as much a human hand as um, a computational system has to be repeated because it's designed to not be seen. So that's, at least from my perspective, why I, you see a lot of headlines that repeat from year to year. A lot of the headlines that you see about AI, we've seen five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. So from that's one answer that I would yeah. have for that. That's a great point. Maybe we're, we have amnesia because it's by design. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think our culture in general um, is based around like having things and then throwing it away, right? Like we just in the ways that we relate to materials or information online, it's like you're, it's not really sustainable. We just have this assumption that we can have what we have now and then like drop it in a landfill and not think about it anymore. And I think we that then mirrors itself in the way that we relate to um, information and knowledge and our relationships with each other. Uh, and, and we were talking um, backstage also about like, it's not just the headlines about tech that are recurring. Looking through this book, you see this work being done over and over and over again. And yet people are out here like, oh, there's not enough women in tech or something. Um, and you do see evolution. You see the work build on itself. Um, you see the citations happening. And so I think we were talking about like, do you get really um, discouraged just seeing this kind of cycle repeat? And I think, while the tech cycle repeats, you also see the things build. And that's, like reading this book um, saved me from kind of like a disillusionment I was falling into by seeing like, oh, it is building. And it, there is a reason to keep saying we're doing this work and to keep doing it. Thank you so much to the both of you. I wish we can go through all of these questions, but I think it's time to turn it over to the audience. Uh, so we're going to open up an audience Q&A portion. And if you do have a question, raise your hand, and someone will hand you a microphone. I see there's one in the back corner. Hi. <laughs> How are you? Um, so my question is about cybersexuality. Um, I was really inspired by Lauren's reading in particular, and it's also something I work on a lot myself. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little more. I was also really inspired by Nora's comment about kind of what I read as being kind of um, sort of treated like a killjoy when you talk about AI, which is something I've also experienced. So it made me think of Sarah Ahmed and the feminist killjoy. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you have any comments specifically around um, cyber feminism and sexuality versus kind of mainstream cyber sexuality and in terms of the embodiment conversation that was opened earlier, um, what can we learn from the cyber feminists in your index? Um, so I just ordered this book called How Sex Changed the Internet and the Internet Changed Sex. It hasn't arrived, but still I can speculate based on all the other examples <laughs> from this book. So I think that S you asked about sexuality, I'm gonna talk specifically about the sex industry, um, has been really important in how the internet has changed over all these years. So because typically sex workers, their work is very villainized in these online platforms, they're almost forced to f adopt these new technologies, thereby helping their development. So we see this happening with cryptocurrencies, for example. Um, some of the first things purchased online or these like, moments of virality or pornographic videos. So I think that whatever, of course there are a lot of uh, criticisms about how sex is causing this intensification of desire and almost acting as like a pseudo sex educational tool. I do think on the outskirts has also allowed a lot of people to find these interstices of what people are interested in, um, what is acceptable socially and sexually. So I think that, as always, as you've seen throughout this talk, there are good things and bad things, and it's complicated. Yeah, I think that um, a lot of uh, 
technological development happens with like sex as one of the first use cases normally or generally like driven by um, mostly men and their sexual desires. I mean, if you think about Meta, Facebook, it basically started as like a hookup um, platform and, you know, created by Mark Zuckerberg. So, uh, and that's a very serious tech, right? And then I think when um, women or non-binary people are, are in introducing sexuality or talking about it, it's often seen as like not serious or inappropriate. And um, I think there's a lot of space to change that dialogue. I would even say really briefly for the figure of the killjoy, I think in the, one of the entries in this book by Annie Go is about the cyber feminist killjoy as a figure who um, needfully gathers other thinkers, other femme thinkers, non-binary thinkers, to create the kind of collective voice that forms a critique of that, that voice on the hill. And Mashinka Hokopian also has, of course, as you know, um, the figure of the artificial killjoy. And what, what I always am struck by from Hamid to Hakopian to Go, their figure, uh, the figuration of the killjoy is actually very joyous. It's someone who really revels in like, the lushness of a relationship to technology when uh, the paradigm is shifted towards these like more equitable or lush or sustainable kind of ends. And it, it really is a figure of joy. So I think I focus on the joy part of, of killjoy a little bit more. Thanks for your question. Hi, um, thanks for the talk. I was wondering, Mindy, you mentioned, um, you, you talked about kind of the, um, how in early, like the early internet, we had these kind of, this idea that you could kind of go online and um, have a different race or a different se gender or sex, um, and how that kind of utopianism, also there was like a pushback against that, but, I, I feel like there's also still, we still see like that in art, uh, in media art. Um, there's like a, there's a show at uh, the Be All Center that kind of touched on that recently. And also this show that opened in Culver City recently that I think a lot of people here probably saw. Uh, so I'm curious about if all of you could, if you want to comment on like how the kind of notion of cyberspace as a place where you can be who you want to be, like be your, change your identity, like how that notion might have changed since the 90s and compared, like comparing, comparing from the 90s until now. Um, I'll give two concrete examples. So uh, there was actually recently this event at the New Museum hosted by Rhizome uh, for Abtech. Um, I'm sorry, I don't remember this acronym, but it's essentially a network of indigenous artists that's been around since the 90s, uh, largely um, directed by Skawanadi, who I mentioned during this talk. So one of the first places they created was called The Palace. Um, and they held these gatherings in it called Cyber Pow Wow. And this allowed you to basically enter these spaces, create an avatar, talk with people online, and they were actually able to archive all of that as well. In talking about how they would replicate that on Rhizome's current server, Artbase, which is their preservation tool, um, it was met with some concern because if they allowed for this chatting function, then they would have to build in a new moderation tool, which at that time in the 90s, there were some trolls, but it was not nearly to the extent that you see now. So now a lot of sites and blogs have removed this chatting function or a comment function unless it's highly moderated uh, or surveilled in some way. I think another example of this is um, Meta's Horizon. So Meta, formerly Facebook, their big VR push right now is called Horizon, their Horizon workspace. And I can't remember if this event is recorded, but I illegally went into Horizon workspace, <laughs> um, which is only allowed for employees. And in this space, 
even though it's in development and they're dog feeding right now, which means they're testing out their own tools, um, to the rest of us, they're marketing this as like, this is a space where we can be anything, you know, like a story we've heard before. But when you get in there, you have an avatar. You can pick from six skin tones. You can pick from six body types and face shapes. You have no legs. And when you go into the office, it's a big conference room with a wall full of windows and you can select which background you want. So they had like this waterfall or something. So I think it kind of shows some of the shortages in imagination of what's being created, especially because of what industry needs. So industry needs remote workspaces that are good for people who work online, which is most people now. Um, but in doing so, they're kind of replicating environments that we already have. So I think that there is still a lot of potential for what these online spaces could be. It could literally be anything. And yet we're still kind of trying to make something look as pixel perfect to our current environment now. So I think maybe that's uh, a bit of a loss, a bit of a loss of imagination. Yeah, I guess I would add, um, thinking about kind of these dynamics of, you know, in the beginning, it's like on the internet, nobody knows you're a cat. Um, and then there, it gets into this very, uh, your, we're realizing, oh, our online identities are actually very real in some way. Um, and then now, I think in the in the last few years with Web3, there's been this turn towards anonymity, um, towards PFPs and avatars. And there's sort of this like techno-utopianism that, um, oh, we've transcended identity, we've transcended race and gender, we're all like lizards now, and it's it's so democratic. Um, and I think that the it's, it's really dangerous because all the dynamics are still there. If you look at who is benefiting um, from the web right now, I think we see the same power dynamics and hierarchies, but they're less legible, they're more obscured because you're not able to actually um, visibly read identities so easily. So I don't know what to do about that, but I think about it a lot. I mean, I definitely long for the days of cyberspace or even thinking about the internet as cyberspace. I mean, in, in like pre-algorithmic capture, the internet was a place that I could learn about all the things my parents didn't tell me about. You could pretend to be whoever you wanted to be. You could talk with people out of your, <laughs> inappropriately out of your age range for until your parents found out. Um, and I, I, I think over time that um, like with Facebook, with social media platforms, this like um, kind of alliance with identity, openness, sharing, community, as like the kind of ground of algorithmic capture so that the more legible that your identity is, the more diverse the data set is, which makes you more legible for perfect capture, because created this kind of very, suff as we all know, this very suffocating loop where the internet um, feels as it does now. So I think with, you know, Web3 and like a lot of the discussions around distributed autonomous organizations and DAOs, I think there is this longing to recreate that feeling of like, an ethos of care and like careful community moderation and a place where um, your your identity and, and the things that you say and the things that you make legible are not like also um, material and substrate for capture. Yeah, I think that when we talk about new technologies, it's also it's always about the tool itself. Like we now have blockchain, we now have VR headsets, we now have X Y Z. But it's really not about the tool, it's about how the tool is used. So I think all of these things, these examples are illustrating, regardless of whatever new technology would push forward, unless we change the behaviors of them or whatever conditions that we're bringing into the space, in some ways it will replicate what we already have and maybe accelerate that as well. Um, it's seven. Do we have time for one more question? Or should we? have informal questions outside with tea and cookies and coffee. I'm looking up at the sound booth because I'm not sure who could answer that question. Oh, they give a thumbs up. Thumbs up, okay. Oh yeah, for one of them, there were two options. I'm gonna assume it's for the cookies because there was a run of show. So thank you so much everyone for coming. Thank you so much to Nora and Lauren, Claudia, and the entire Hammer team for making this event so seamless. 
please hang out with us outside. We'll see you in a bit.